Twice the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth that ye are bought with a price. So the question that I would like to ask today and answer is what did Paul mean when he told the Corinthians that they were bought with a price? First of all, we notice that in Paul's fervent argument against engaging in sexual immorality, the inspired apostle concluded, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. When people become Christians, they're set apart from the world as new creatures in Christ. And that's the reason that the New Testament refers to them as saints. It means they have been set apart by their conversion to be faithful servants of God. Of course, that took place because they were baptized into Christ as believers who had repented of their sins and confessed their faith in Christ for the remission of sins. Thus, they rise from the water and grave of baptism with their sins washed away, new creatures in Christ. In his second letter to the Corinthians, the apostle Paul again wrote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 We must remember that, as I mentioned baptism earlier, that when you read Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia, in Galatians 3 and verse 27, he says that they had been baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. And thus we understand when he says that when you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Well, they were baptized into Christ, and therefore they were baptized for and to in order to a given point. And what was it? Forgiveness or remission of sins. And on this very point, the inspired writer to the Hebrews pen, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10 and verse 10. Then James also wrote, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, James 1 and verse 28, uh, 18. Now, there's one thing that ought to be emphasized here is that when, you're, when you become a Christian, the very process of becoming a Christian is the conversion process. You're moving from one state in manner of life to another state in manner of life. And after you've believed in Christ properly, obeyed Acts 17, 30, and repenting of your sins, willing to stand before men and confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, being qualified, now you're ready to receive the remission of forgiveness of sins. Well, all sin ultimately is against God, 1 John 3, 4. Thus, where does that forgiveness of sins take place? Well, it does in the mind of God where he viewed you as a lost person alienated from him by the sins you committed, then he's authored a plan through Jesus Christ. It's the only one in existence, the gospel plan of salvation. The gospel is the power of God to save, Romans 1.16. That when one submits to that plan and is obedient to each step in that plan of salvation, he is converted from one state, a lost state, a separated state from God, to a saved state, into Christ where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. And notice it involves the church. That's where he adds the saved, or where he adds the lost. Get right in a minute. Where he adds the saved to the institution built to house the saved, which is the church. Thus, you see how that the church is involved in our salvation. It's the place where his new creatures live. They enter that doorway through baptism, having believed in Christ, and repented of their sins, and confessed their faith in him. And now as they are buried with Christ in baptism, they are raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. 
We must remember that in the infant church, they had no written and completed New Testament. It wasn't there for them to study. Much of their study had to do with the Old Testament. Much of their preaching convinced people that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. That would especially be the case when it came to Jews who were very familiar with the Old Testament. So God put into the infant church, the church of the apostolic age, miraculous gifts so that brethren, once they are saints, once they are new creatures in Christ, could grow and develop while the New Testament was being revealed and written. And that was their guideline in the faith until the New Testament of Christ was fully revealed by the miracles done, confirmed to be from heaven and not from men, and written down. And of these particular miraculous gifts, Paul wrote, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Then parenthetically he writes, now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Then he continues with his main thought in verse 11, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying spiritual growth and development of the body of Christ. How long should these things exist? Till, adverb of time, we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, 8 through 13. Now we rarely, I won't say rarely, but many times we do not refer to this passage in Ephesians 4 when we're talking about miraculous gifts, but we should because it's a parallel passage to the other one we're going to look at in just a moment. The apostles of Christ, you remember, received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. Now, that being the case, they were guided, they were directly taught and led by the Holy Spirit, for through them Jesus revealed his will. The church understood that through the apostles of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord was miraculously guiding the church. Acts 2 and verse 42. Now regarding the miraculous gifts that were possessed by Christians who were not apostles, Luke tells us that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that those gifts were imparted. We read Luke's account of the gospel being preached in Samaria. And when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And of course, in Peter's rebuke follows, because he says, This doesn't pertain to you. You have thought the gift of God may be bought with money. Again, Acts 8, 14 through 20. My question here is, as far as the people in the church who had miraculous gifts, but they were not apostles, is why can't we see what Simon saw? Simon plainly saw, and it impressed him so much, that it was through the laying on the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was given. Well, that's not the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. That came directly from heaven as the Lord had promised in John 14, 15, 16, as we studied about this morning from Luke. So the apostles, as the ambassadors of the court of heaven, could work all nine miraculous gifts, which list is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Plus one, they could lay hands on people and impart miraculous gifts to them. Why? 
because they have no New Testament of Christ written down to follow. It's in the very process of these words being written that we have the New Testament coming into existence. What are they to do to live righteous? How are they to live in this time period? How are they to know what God wants them to do? Well, the early church understood that the apostles were those who had received that baptismal measure and that Christ through the Holy Spirit by them was teaching them. And by the way, the apostles were doing today exactly what they did then when they were alive on this earth. For we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine if we become Christians and live the Christian life. It's just simply written down. Do you think Paul would teach anything different today if he were on this earth than he taught and is included in the New Testament that you have? In the apostles' letter, first letter to the Corinthians, he, was wrote, he also wrote to correct their abuse of miraculous gifts. And thereby we learn about, uh, much about those gifts as he goes about to correct them in their misuse and abuse of those gifts. Now let me say, in view of the fact that he could write an inspired letter, the Holy Spirit himself inspired him to write it, to correct them in their abuse of the gifts which the Holy Spirit had also given them through the laying on the apostles' hands, that it tells us that even though they had these miraculous gifts, they could misuse them or use them correctly. And when Paul corrected them, the Holy Spirit guided him to write and say, here's how I want my gifts used. If you're going to benefit from them, here's how the Holy Spirit says you're to use the very gifts that he gave through us when we laid hands on you. And that's what you have in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. Notice, and this is the passage that's parallel to Ephesians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. Charity or love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Well, you know he's not talking about knowing the normal way we come to know anything. Because the very reason he wrote this was so we could be informed or know what he had to say. So he's talking about miraculous knowledge. I can tell you right now, I wonder what it would be like to be able to stand up and just speak on any subject you needed to without previous study. Well, that goes along with the Holy Spirit's work with the apostles and the prophets, the gift of prophecy as they laid hands upon other people. You could just start speaking any language you needed to to teach the gospel to somebody that spoke it and it would sound as if you were born in their own part of the world and grew up speaking that language. So it shall vanish away. That is, this miraculous thing will cease really of itself is what it means. But we know in part, how did the New Testament come? As there was a need to be instructed, it was revealed to them. That's exactly right. Now, does that help you understand why that the church continued for a good while before they ever preached the gospel to uncircumcised Gentiles? As the need arose, as God unfolded his plan, then all of a sudden, years after the church was established, God chooses Peter to tell him, Hey, Jews, the gospel isn't just for you. It's not just for the Samaritans, and that was a big growth in them to be able to go to the Samaritans with the gospel. But it's for uncircumcised Gentiles. So, for we know in part, we prophesy in part. Well, what are you looking for, Paul? Well, people today want to have miracles. Paul was looking past the miracles because he knew the design and purpose of miracles. Listen. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What was coming in part? The revelation, as they needed it, it finally came together in what we know the New Testament. But it was delivered in part and parcel. So Paul says, that's going to cease when the whole thing's finished. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, miracles belong to the childish things. The infant stage of the church, that's the reason we call it that. It does not have a written down, completed New Testament. How are they guided? By the miraculous gifts. As I say, they're listed all nine of them, 1 Corinthians 12. Well, they had to be employed properly. The people at Corinth weren't. Now, sometimes we think that's the only church that had miraculous gifts that he had to correct. No, that's just an example of what could happen to any church at that time. And that letter simply took into account the fact that if they did it at Corinth, do you think that's the only place people would misuse and abuse those gifts? Well, of course not. 
And so it is, the letter was written so it could be passed around among the churches and they'd all be instructed in how to use the miraculous gifts because they used their gifts as they will to do so. P uh, Paul even told Timothy not to neglect the gift. So you could have a miraculous gift, but you'd have to use it. Yet Paul told him that's given to you for the edification. So the gifts were under the control of the people who had them. Thus they could abuse them or they could misuse them. And took a letter as the New Testament was being written from Paul to tell them, you don't do it this way and you don't do it that way. You do it this way. And the biggest thing is that you've got to have the proper love to approach this, these things and use them correctly. Thus, that's why 1 Corinthians 13 is written right in the middle of his correction of their abuse of miraculous gifts. So he says, I, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, at the time he wrote this, these letters, for now we see through a glass darkly. You got to understand in those days they polished brass and that was their mirror. So you don't see a very good reflection. Have you ever looked at the chrome of your car and tried to straighten your tie or something like that? That's the kind of mirrors they had. They didn't have what we have nowadays. That's why when you look at a glass darkly, that's what he means. They didn't have the type of thing. Okay, but then face to face. Now at the present when I'm writing this Apostle Paul, I know in part. But then, now when's the then? Because whenever then is, I, shall I know even as also I am known. He's talking about the perfect law of liberty. Now that's why in James 1 verse 25 that James said as he wrote part of that New Testament, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Perfect means complete. It does not mean flawless. Uh, we can be perfect or complete to do the work God wants the church to do, but I don't think any of us would say, no matter how strong our faith is, that we don't need to grow and develop. So we need to understand the New Testament use of the word perfect here and in James 1.25. So when we learn that uh, that which is perfect has come means the completed New Testament of Christ, then we know all these miraculous gifts are going to pass away. But at the time that he wrote that ye are new creatures in Christ. He was writing part of that New Testament. And the will of heaven was being distributed by the Holy Spirit in part and parcel. It was the Apostle Paul on the second preaching tour who first preached the gospel in Corinth. And the church began in that city according to Acts 8, 18 and verse 8. So it is that it was the Apostle Paul who imparted through the laying on of hands these miraculous gifts to the members of the Corinthian church. And you find that out because in the second letter he is defending his apostleship because some were saying since he was a Johnny come lately and wasn't there with the rest of the apostles throughout the life of Christ and all that, that he really wasn't an apostle. And that's what the Judaizing teachers did to a great extent, trying to discredit Paul because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. But watch his argument. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. How do you know he's an apostle? He has the credentials of an apostle. He can work the miracles that only the apostles did. And one of those was laying hands on people. Remember what Peter said? You don't have any part in a lot in this. Uh, Simon had seen Philip preach and work miracles to confirm the word he preached was from heaven and not from men. But what fascinated and got the attention of Simon was when they came down there and had the power to lay hands on people and impart those gifts like Philip had. And that's what he wanted. He was not asking, give me a miraculous gift. He was asking for the power to impart those miraculous gifts. And Peter rebuked him severely, saying, first of all, you thought the gift of God could be bought with money and then worked him over the coals right there. And of course, he said, pray to God that this not come upon me, which I think evidences his repentance. The point is, all of this was being done and you're new creatures in Christ. And since you belong to God, you've received the Holy Spirit in the form of these gifts now, how can you commit fornication when you have this kind of thing guiding and directing you in the church? You can't belong to the world and belong to God 
and have these miraculous gifts being used as you ought to use them and for the reason God gave them and still live on that worldly plane. That's what he means by having received the Spirit. A lot of brethren, a lot of people don't believe that. They think, well, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the miraculous age. I think anybody would be hard-pressed to talk about the work of the Spirit in some sort of silent way in the first century. Because everything you read about the Holy Spirit was that he was being seen through the miraculous gifts, number one, of the apostles, and number two, through those that had the apostles' hands laid upon them and received one of those gifts that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And thus, they had to even use them correctly. And you don't live of the world. You don't live like the old man. You're a new creature in Christ. You have these things working for you to give you what you need because there is no revealed, completed New Testament. Now, therefore, if that's the case, Keep your life clean as the Bible says you ought to. So Paul repeated this teaching in 1 Corinthians 7 in verse 23. But he then did it with an emphasis on spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Believers... Members of the church, Christians, are set free from the dominion of sin. We were set free from being slaves to sin by the death of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verse 4. Now listen to Paul in the most quoted verse or verses in Romans chapter 6. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So therefore the new creature is a servant of righteousness. The Greek word is doulos. It means a bondservant or a slave. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Jesus redeemed you. We use that word redeemed. I don't think sometimes we realize what it means. You don't belong to yourself. Do as you please. You were set free from the powers of the flesh, the way most men normally operate, the appetites thereof that John talks about, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. No, you're set free from that. You're set free from your alien sins. Your sins were washed away in baptism. The Lord added you to his church. You're, you're converted in all that means to Christ. Your life is hid in Christ. You're in the church, the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, wherein are located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. And in effect, he can simply say this, now live like it. That's basically what he did say. You have no excuse to go back and live like the world. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to God. You're to live according to the head of the church of which you are a member. His will guides you. So our spiritual freedom comes at the price of Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. Peter says as much in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Consequently, since we now belong to Christ, we must let ourselves come under, must not let ourselves come under the control of other humans or the passions of our own flesh. We are free moral agents. We determine what we think about. You could not repent if you did not have the natural power to repent. You could not consider your own self and the way you're living and the light of that perfect law of liberty if you were not created to be able to do that. So whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. So it's a matter of the will. Just like the people misusing and abusing the miraculous gifts in Corinth, then they could be taught the proper use, they could repent of the bad use, and they could once again enjoy them and use them. That's the argument he uses for their misuse and abuse uh, to clean it up, if you please, and use them rightly of those miraculous gifts. And he does the same thing regarding being worldly in your life. He says, since the Spirit's in you doing these things, don't you engage in fornication. Don't you lie. Don't you think wrong thoughts. Because you're hid in Christ. You belong to Him he shed his blood to purchase you on the cross. Without that, you could not be free from sin. That's what it means to be converted. 
Paul's phrase, be not ye the servants of men, was then used metaphorically. We are not to let human ideas and worldly systems rule over us. When you say that some church members are worldly, what do you mean when you say that? Well, we should know by now after this little study. You're living like the people of the world who don't acknowledge Christ, who don't follow Christ, who don't study their Bible, who don't do what he says. And by the way, you're right back to that scripture above my head. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Colossians 3.17. So we must not allow ourselves to be bound by the will of men or loose from God's word for what God's word binds on us. That's why we must preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. We must learn how to ascertain Bible authority. We must learn to be honest with God, with the Bible, and with ourselves. We are responsible to God for what we think, what we say, what we do. We must understand what conversion means. We must understand that we are not our own, but we're bought with a price. So we're to do only what the New Testament of Christ authorizes us to do. Jesus alone is our master. But when you look at Galatians and you look at Corinthians, a lot of those folks just didn't put two and two together. And I suggest to you that if they had that problem, there are going to be people in the church today who have that problem, and they need the same information said to them. Information is revealed from heaven to men members of the church, of what is it to be a new creature in Christ. I think I can sum it up as we close the lesson. You just don't belong to yourself anymore. You've heard me mention a few times old sister Kinchelo in Van Buren, who's kind of grumpy old lady, and I think she enjoyed being that way. How do you do this morning, sister Kinchelo? I do just as I please. That was a regular answer. Well, nobody really does that. But that does say something, whether she was joking or not. It does say we can't be that way. And yet I suggest to you 99% of the problems in the Lord's church is not because somebody's brought in false doctrine, whether it loses us what God binds on us or whether it binds on us what God did. It's an attitude problem. We don't know we're new creatures in Christ. We don't fully grasp what it means that I don't belong to me. I belong to Jesus Christ. And I must have the mind of Christ. And the only place I can is to study the last will and testament of Jesus Christ and do things his way. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, you won't become one except you do things his way. We've already gone over several times the very steps in the plan of salvation. That's the way you become a Christian. Now, if you've done that, have you been living like the new creature the Bible says you are when you come forth and water the grave of baptism? Well, Paul called the church at Corinth and the mess it was in, the church of God, but he's teaching them. He's working with them. And that involves reproving, rebuking, and exhorting them of all long-suffering and doctrine. And that's the way it just has to be if people are to grow and to develop to be like the Lord. I think we would all say, I want to be like Jesus Christ. When you say that, you're making a marvelous statement. If it comes from the heart, then you know it means a lot of radical changes on the part of a lot of people so that we'll be able to say as we sing that song, let him have his way with thee. Because you'll have to let him. He won't butt in. You'll have to let him by obedience to the gospel. If you need to repent of sins, confess them to God so that he'll hear as we pray and you'll be forgiven, that's God's second law of pardon. You need to obey the gospel. We invite you to come while we stand and sing.